Good morning, everyone. Welcome to River Heights Vineyard Church. My name is John. I'm one of the worship pastors here. It's my honor to welcome you to our worship service today. Um, we love worshiping together, and it's, um, it's fun to be standing here and to be able to see the whole room and feel like we are really doing this together. So thank you for being here. I invite you to stand as we come into worship together. You're welcome to rise in spirit if that is better for you this morning where you are. And I'll pray for us as we begin our time of worship. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we trust that you have brought us here. And we also say in return that we want more of you. We want to see more of your power in our lives, more of your love in our world, and we want to be a part of bringing that about. Would you give us the grace for these things this morning, even as we worship?
praise you, God. the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and put me back together Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you.
with the announcements. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. My name is Pete. I'm one of the pastors here. Super glad that you are here as well. If you are visiting today, it's your first Sunday with us. We are most especially glad that you came. Stop by the Welcome Center after the service. We have a welcome box and some propaganda for you to view. It's going to be an amazing experience. We would love to say hi to you. Uh, Jordan's going to be preaching today, and he'd love to meet you as well, so come on down. Uh, we have a purpose as a community here. It is to help people love God, love people, and change the world. That's everything that we are about doing as a church. On Sundays, we have an opportunity to give toward that purpose. You can do so electronically, or you can put gifts in a connection card boxes. Either way, let's pray into that. Uh, God, we just want to come today with gratitude. You have been so generous to us. You have given us everything we have today. You've given us your son your presence, your spirit, your love. You've given us a family, and we thank you. Uh, we want to give back, God. As we give back, it is our hope that you would turn what we give into your stuff, more people loving each other, more people loving you here outside our walls and around the world. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Could you please take the connection card out of your program? We ask would you please fill one of these out each week that you are with us on a Sunday? If you're with us regularly, you can just put your name on the front. If you're visiting, give us as much information as you're comfortable. There's stuff happening you can interact with, but we especially like to highlight the spot for prayer requests. We want you to know there's somebody praying for you and the people you love in your church. And so let us know how to pray. And during the week, our pastoral staff and our prayer team will pray for all of the requests that we receive. And you'll know there's people lifting up your requests to God on your behalf. At the end of the service, these go in the connection card boxes at the end of the aisle. Uh, men in the room, our monthly men's breakfast that happens on the first Saturday of the month was canceled this last week due to a workshop. Jordan Sang came out from Hawaii and led us through a miracle work workshop that was really fantastic. So the men's breakfast is this Saturday at my house. We'll have 20-some guys. There'll be a short testimony, a short devotion, and we'll pray for each other, and we'll eat delicious food. And so I would love to have you come. Directions and address and so forth are inside the program. Uh, if you're looking for a church home, if you're looking to find more ways to connect here at River Heights Vineyard, we have three membership classes, Connect, Grow, and Belong, that are an awesome opportunity to do those things. Belong's going to be on Sunday, February 11th at 1 o'clock. These classes are all 50% learning about the church and the vineyard, and 50% you and other new folks sharing your answers to questions. And so when you leave, you like know people who can say hi to you on Sunday, who can ask how you're doing, and it's a good start to relationship building. If you've not done the membership classes, I encourage you to come. We do have child care if you let us know that you need it. And so that's going to be Sunday, February 11th at 1 o'clock. We have Ash Wednesday coming up. Ash Wednesday is a time in church tradition on the calendar that kicks off Lent. Lent's a season of contemplation and preparation. It's a time of spiritually getting ready for the celebration that is Easter. Traditionally during Lent, people fast, people give something up, people spend more time in prayer. Ash Wednesday is a day to mark the start of that season. Because Ash Wednesday is on Valentine's Day this year, and tell me that doesn't say all the things. Ash Wednesday is on Valentine's Day. Come on, people, there's some symbolism. Uh, because of that, we're not going to have an Ash Wednesday evening service. What we are offering is during the day, you can drop in between 10 and 2. We'll have about a 15-minute exercise of contemplation and prayer for you, and you can receive an imposition of ashes on your forehead if you choose. We encourage you to come on by if that sounds good to you. I am so happy to announce that Alpha is coming again. So uh, starting February 21st, Wednesdays, 6 to 8 p.m., um, Alpha is an opportunity to get together, have an exceptional meal. Our Alpha cooking team is amazing. And then you watch a short video about a question of faith, and it's designed for people who are on the journey. And if you consider yourself a person who's on the journey, it is for you. Um, the question might be something like, what's up with the Bible? Why do people go to church? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there evil in the world? And then you just talk about them, and you listen to everybody else at your table. And nobody's right. It's just an opportunity to explore things that actually matter with your time. So many people are busy doing things. Like, how many people have enough Netflix and chill in your life? Does anybody have enough, like, internet, TV, phone, like, things that aren't actually all that meaningful? This is an opportunity to do something that has real meaning. I would love to have you join an alpha. If you are a person who listens well to other people, 
I would love to have you be a table leader in Alpha. If you would like to be part of it, sign up, let us know, and we'll get you on the team. Uh, on that note, the middle schoolers, the 6th to 8th grade, are dismissed to middle church through the back door that way. Uh, Jordan is going to come up and deliver the message forthwith. Good morning, everybody. Aloha. I was kind of a Minnesotan. Aloha. That's kind of, yeah. Aloha. Yeah, all right, we're getting there. All right, that's a good job. Uh, nice to be with you uh, here in Minnesota where Hawaiians come to vacation. Uh, I was prepared for the worst. This is beautiful. I mean, nicely done. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I just want you to know that uh, we have two Minnesotans on my staff at my church. There's a strong Hawaii-Minnesota connection. You can probably feel it. Um, my name is Jordan, and it's been really cool to be here with you uh, this weekend. I appreciate uh, all the hospitality uh, that you've shown me. How many of you were at the little conference we did this weekend? What are we, like half the people or something? So that was great. We got a lot of cool stories uh, from the conference, uh, saw God do some uh, creative and cool things for people to improve uh, their lives. My church is called uh, Blue Water Mission. Uh, I'm in Hawaii. You might think, well, you call yourself Blue Water for obvious reasons, and it's true. We are surrounded by ocean. It's lovely. Uh, blue Water is a sailing term um, that means uh, to be out far from land. You know, if you're in the blue water, then you're in the deep, distant water. You're like ocean crossing and stuff like that. It's called blue water sailing. And we call ourselves Blue Water Mission because we're trying to keep ourselves honest. You know, that we're trying to be out far with God, you know, like beyond the safe places, out far and in deep with God. It's one of our slogans. Uh, so that's us. When I travel and do conferences and speak at other churches and stuff like that, uh, my church wants them to know that they send their blessings to you, so I'm obligated to say that. Uh, Blue Water Mission sends their blessings and their aloha uh, to you today. And, um, and they, they want credit, really, is, is what they want. And it's like they're praying for you, and they want you to know that because they're righteous people and stuff like that. We, uh, we have this uh, island tradition uh, called Talk Story. Um, when you introduce yourself to someone, you're getting to know someone that you don't know. Um, uh, socially in the islands, you're kind of obligated to share stories first. Like you can't go directly to business. You can't just go straight to business. That seems rude. Uh, and so you just swap a few stories, swap a few personal stories. Uh, and one of the things you're doing is uh, as you tell stories, you're trying to find out uh, who you know in common and stuff like that. You're trying to make connections, you know. So I tell you, oh, actually, we have two people from Minnesota on my staff that's supposed to make us feel connected. And it's like, all right, yeah, we're okay. We can trust each other and stuff like that. We tell stories. And anyway, that's, that's kind of the social dance that we do. So my church likes me to tell blue water stories uh, where I go, you know, and they kind of feel a connection. And then I'm supposed to bring back some stories from the conferences and stuff. That's the routine. Anyway, so I need to tell you a story. Uh, I was thinking first service, I can't remember what stories I told during the conference. So, so pardon me if you've, if you've heard this uh, before, but some recent stories uh, from my, my congregation to this beautiful congregation. Uh, uh, one of the things that happened for us at my church during shutdown, the only good thing 
maybe it was that our youth group grew. Like, the rest of the church was just devastated. Uh, Hawaii was really buttoned down. Um, we basically could not meet as a church for two years. Um, and Hawaii is a very tough place to make a living, a really tough place for young families to make a living. So a lot of people had to leave the island from our congregation. We lost like 70% of our people. Um, but the youth group did great. I think in part because like teens are really comfortable relating online. Not my generation. But um, so they kind of grew, got to know each other. We saw a lot of teens come to Christ and stuff like that. We had to delay all the youth activities. And our youth group likes to go abroad to visit other islands or to go on missions trips. And so finally, when, the, when everything cleared up, you know, and we could do things, uh, my uh, youth minister, who's from Minnesota, uh, said, all right, now we're going to take the mission trip, Jordan. And they've been planning this mission trip to the Philippines uh, for years at that point. Uh, and huge Filipino population in the Hawaiian Islands, and so it's a natural connection. So we put together a group of our teens, and we sent them off to a pretty rough city, rough island in the Philippines to just do their best to, to bring the kingdom uh, and get some kingdom experience. And uh, it was a lovely time. Sent a bunch of teens, including some new believers. And on that trip uh, was my son, uh, Jeremiah, who had just turned 18. I think he had just turned 18. And uh, uh, super excited to go. And uh, while they were there, they did outreach and stuff like that, and Jeremiah had his opportunity to preach his first sermon in a church. Uh, it's this little church kind of in this jungle area, and people from all around came because they heard, like, this, these Americans were there. This American kid was going to preach. So he stood up to preach his first sermon in the Philippines. Uh, I wasn't there, uh, but uh, the youth minister recorded it for me on his phone, right? So it's cool. obviously that's going to be a family heirloom someday, right? It's like my kid preaching his first sermon in this, this rough church uh, in the Philippines. So he stood up to preach his first sermon, and as his topic, uh, Jeremiah chose... Uh, Miracles. He's going to talk about doing miracles. Um, the audacious kid. Um, so uh, I got to watch this sermon. He stands up and he's talking in front of this crowd through this uh, interpreter. Uh, this little woman was helping him uh, preach. And, and this is what he says. He says, to do miracles, you need faith. But you don't need perfect faith. He said, you need like 70% faith. I have no idea where he got that figure. <laughs> like, well, where does that come from? How do, how do you calculate that? I have no idea. But he's like, all you need is like 70% faith. I'm like, all right, all right. And he finishes his sermon, shares a few stories and scriptures, and he said, all right, so if we can have just a little bit of faith here, I'd like to perform some miracles. Uh, and, um, and then he... So he just prays over the crowd. Like, You're sick. I'd just like to heal you today. And he prays over the crowd, kind of releases healing. And on the, on the tape, you, you hear this woman start screaming. She's like freaking out. Ah, ah, ah. So it turned out that she had come in uh, with this, this outrageous fever. She had been fighting this effect, infection for a long time. That's swollen lymph nodes and couldn't talk right and stuff like that. Well, anyway, the spirit had fallen on her. And just healed her immediately. And she just felt everything break and her throat get better. And she was like, yeah, I can't believe it worked. I can't believe it worked. So she starts screaming. Of course, then the faith in the room rises after that one. And they pray for this elderly woman who had come. And she had, um, her lungs weren't working. Uh, she had, it's hard to tell exactly because things were being translated. But I believe she had tuberculosis that had become advanced and sort of damaged her lungs, compromised her lungs. Anyway, they're, they're ministering to her, and her lungs clear. And you hear her husband say through the interpreter, she can breathe, she can breathe, and she gets, she gets healed. Um, so that was my son's first sermon, and it's like, beginner's luck. <laughs> you know, it's like, seriously, showing up dad. Come on, that's disrespectful. <laughs> The kids get very excited by the experience, you know, and they tell great stories about this. And so they took them out into the village at that point. 
and they go house to house. The, the team, the kids team breaks up into uh, t- kids. They would like me to call them that, the teens. Uh, they break up into groups of two and three, and they go visit all the, all the houses on the streets in the town. And uh, they tell great stories about this. Uh, one kid who was traveling with me last week, I was doing a conference last week, and I dragged him with me, said, yeah, they, he showed up at this house, and the whole family was antagonistic to, to Jesus, like, oh, we don't want Jesus, we don't want Christianity, our traditional gods are what we want, blah, blah, blah. And 20 minutes later, he said they were all on the floor of the house weeping, crying out to Jesus, sort of accepting him into their lives, and that's how the story goes. Anyway, that's my talk story. Now I feel like we know each other a little bit better, so on the count of three, three tell me your name, one, two, three. All right, thank you. Uh, my church sent its blessing. I've done my job. <laughs> and when you come to Hawaii to visit, uh, you can tell them, oh, yeah, we know each other. I, I don't really know uh, how my son calculated that 70% faith uh, figure. Um, but uh, I do appreciate that he's thinking about it. And, and uh, I kind of feel like my whole life uh, has really been uh, an exploration of faith kind of a hunt for faith. This is something that just fascinates me. The whole concept of faith just fascinates me. And it's fascinated me since I was a a little kid, in large part because I feel like I suck at faith. I feel like I'm just really bad at it. It does not come naturally to me at all. I'm not naturally confident or trusting or or positive uh, in, in any way. And it started when I was a kid. I had kind of a a rough situation uh, when, when I was uh, young. We don't really need to go into it, but there's a lot of brokenness and bizarreness and insecurity uh, in, in my life. And, um, and I was a super depressed kid. And the, the first time uh, I can remember holding a blade to my wrist, thinking about killing myself, I was five years old. And it's like, it's like super depressed, kind of suicidally depressed, thinking a lot about death, which is not what healthy five-year-olds do. Um, you know, and so juxtaposed against that, this idea of faith was stark, you know. Um, but I uh, was introduced to, some Jesus, to Jesus through some babysitters that I had in my life, really cool people. They gave me a living Bible that I was able to read when uh, I was moving around the country, running from the cops. That's another story. But um, uh, I read these stories you know, of, of, of people uh, trusting God and, and, and doing miracles. And, and I, as a child, I just took them very openly, very honestly, you know, very simply. Faith, you know, and I, and I feel like I've been getting used to it ever since. I'm trying to understand. There's so many great ways to describe faith. You know, one of the things we say at my church is faith means trying Right? Faith isn't what you believe. It's what you do with what you believe. You know, so faith means trying and try things. I'm a pretty decent trier. I don't know if I'm a great truster, but trust is another word for faith, you know, belief. The, actually, the best sermon I ever heard my son preach was when he was six years old. And he was just thinking through faith for the first time, trying to figure it out. And then one night over dinner, he said, Dad, I've been thinking. Faith is close to brave. I was like, I'm going to steal that. That's, that's a great sermon right there, you know. So, I don't know, the kid's probably gifted. This, this, and this great sermon's faith. Um, so many great words for it. Um, it's clear, if you read the Jesus stories in the Gospels, that faith is what kind of releases the kingdom of heaven on earth. Nine times in the gospel when Jesus has healed someone or delivered someone or in some fashion miraculously uh, restored them, he says, your faith made you well. Which I don't think is a very Christian thing to say um, because what he should say is like, you know, God made you well or praise the Lord or like, you know, respect uh, me sent by God. I don't know, something. But instead he says, yeah, y- you did that. Your faith did that which is so interesting, you know, so provocative uh, to me. The power of faith is like faith is the point, you know, 
we're supposed to have faith, and that's where the restorative power comes from. Uh, and not having faith seems to be kind of the problem in life. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that God has made faith too hard, you know, because he should appear in the sky and be like, yo, I exist, deal with it. And do you not think that that would make you better people if he did that? That that would solve problems. Everybody could believe in God if he were obvious, and then the world would go much better, right? The oldest story we have as humanity is the story of creation and Garden of Eden. It goes back into time immemorial. And, and really what that is about is, is how... Well, belief and faith are different things because back in the Garden of Eden, as the stories tell us, God walked with people directly, right? His existence was very plain to humans. Adam and Eve walked with God in the Garden. They knew for certain that he existed, but they did not trust him, right? They didn't trust his character. They didn't trust his advice, his wisdom, and you know the story, right? Uh, they believed in, he, in his existence. They knew he was there, but they, you know, he gave us the power of choice, and we chose to do something stupid. We chose to not trust him. The original lie came from the original deceiver, right? And, and the lie was, the reason God doesn't want you to eat that fruit is because he thinks, you know, you'll become powerful like him. He wants to lord it over you. So it was a lie about the character of God. God is an oppressor. He's a tyrant. Anyway, you know the story. And so we believed in God, but we did not trust him. So what God has done, he sort of re-engineered the world, and he made it so that now we have to trust him just to believe he exists. You know, he, he's exercising a different part of our brain, a different part of our heart, because he is saying to us, look, trust is the point. Trust is the point. So I'm going to make it a little harder for you to believe in my existence in order to provoke trust, faith, bravery, courage, trying, whatever word that you choose. And if we do the faith well, well, life flows again, right? The garden emerges again. Restoration happens again. And that's kind of how I understand life. That's kind of how I come to it. Faith releases the good stuff. That's a deeply theological point for you. And I'm trying to fight my way to faith and figuring, trying to figure out what makes it work. Like, how do I get there? How do I get to a place of faith? And of course, because I think churches are beautiful things, how do we help each other uh, get to faith. So in that spirit, I'll share a scripture this morning like a responsible pastor. Uh, and I want to uh, read uh, to you a story from Mark chapter 5, which is one of my favorite stories uh, about faith, one of my favorite stories from the Gospels, uh, to be honest with you. Mark chapter 5, we'll read verses 24 to 34. I think it's going to be up on the big screen. You can follow along and read in your Bibles. But this is a story from the early-ish parts of Jesus' ministry on earth. And at this point in the narrative, Jesus uh, is becoming a little uh, famous. Uh, he's done some miracles, uh, cast out some demons, healed some people, you know, fed crowds miraculously with loaves and fishes, that sort of thing. And so the crowds are starting to really turn out for Jesus. Wherever he goes, they're like, oh, you know, at the very least we're going to get a free lunch, that sort of thing. Uh, and he has uh, just crossed the lake a couple times, a uh, lake nearby where he lives. Um, he's cast some demons out in a place. He's coming back to shore in a different place, and the crowds anticipate his arrival. He's trying to run, the, run from the crowds a little bit, but they anticipate his arrival. So when he shows up on the beach, there are big crowds waiting for him, and we pick up the story. There... Uh, a person has come to him, kind of an important person, and said, my daughter is sick. Would you come to my house and take care of her? So he and the crowds are moving along, and they're going to heal this girl. That's the idea. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. So this woman is hemorrhaging, you know, and it has to do with her 
her, uh, her menstrual cycle, her monthly bleeding. She starts bleeding, and then it just doesn't stop. For 12 years, she's bleeding. So you can imagine what that did to her body. Uh, she's just bleeding all the time, so she gets very anemic. She gets very weak, just totally fatigued all the time. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. Nobody can fix it. And had spent all she had. So in addition to everything else, she's now just terribly broke. Um, she had spent all she had. Uh, there's sort of an implication here that she doesn't have a husband anymore if she ever had one because it's all of her money. Uh, women you know, weren't as present in the workforce in those days as they are now. So she's probably in a very, very desperate financial circumstances on top of just being totally sick and wasted. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. So it's getting worse over the time. You can imagine what that did to her attitude. When she heard about Jesus, when she heard about Jesus, there were no printed materials. She couldn't read about Jesus. There was no internet. Or she, she just heard rumors, probably. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, touched his jacket. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. We did a lot of healing ministry at the conference over the weekend. I just love this healing model. This healing model is sneak up behind a prayer minister and touch their clothes and run. <laughs> That's the model. Uh, so write that down. That's the way to heal people. If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. For some reason, she thought this. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. So it immediately worked. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, which is a cool phrase. Like, what just happened? I just felt something really powerful go down. He turned around in the crowd, big press of people, and asked, Who touched my clothes? She did, he didn't know who she was, what was going on. He's totally surprised by what happened, um, which is great. Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciple answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? Jesus, like you're in the mosh pit, like everybody's touching you. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. No, no, I'm not leaving until I get to the bottom of this. Something just went down. What's the deal? Then the woman knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, we'll talk about that in a second, told him the whole truth, gave him the whole story, everything. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. It's one of those times when he said, oh, your faith did that. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Only I guarantee you that's not how he said it. Um, as I think he was really excited. Plus, you know, he's a Mediterranean. So I think what he said was something like, daughter, your faith did that. That is freaking awesome. Your faith is what healed you. Go in peace. Don't worry about a thing. Everybody's gonna totally bless you and, and leave you alone. Be freed from your suffering. Live a great life. Uh, in the original Greek, that's what it says. You can read it. As I'm pretty sure. Uh, my Bible is more interesting than your Bible. Um, but I think that's kind of how he said it. I think he got very excited. Um, I love this story because it just generates so many questions for me. Uh, as a practitioner of the kingdom and a guy who just thinks really hard about faith and all the power that it releases, it's just a, a provocative story. This woman had been bleeding for 12 years. So maybe you've studied the culture, maybe you've studied the story before, and you kind of know the backstory on it. If a woman was bleeding, her monthly bleeding, uh, in, in that culture, in that age, due to some biblical concepts and stuff like that, she was considered... Uh, well, she had some advantages. She was given some privileges, but she was also given some restrictions. Uh, a woman who was bleeding was considered ceremonially unclean and socially isolated for the duration of her bleeding. So a woman who was bleeding could not leave the house. 
could not be in public, could not be around other people. It was a culture that was very careful about blood uh, for all sorts of reasons. So uh, if she were bleeding for 12 years, that meant that she had to essentially shelter in place for 12 years. She couldn't go outside. She couldn't leave the house. So not only did this uh, affliction just totally hollow her out physically, it would have completely isolated her socially, right? She spent all the money she had. She couldn't have gone out and worked to get more money if she wanted to. Just completely devastating, right? I feel like having gone through the whole COVID thing, all the shutdown and seen so many of my friends and loved ones lose their jobs as a result, you know, I think, all right. But 12 years, people, 12 years, she was just shut down and shut off. So there's that. But she left her house in this story, which was against the law. She technically could have been killed for doing this because the people in her society would have considered her a contaminant. You know, it's like having COVID, walking into a big crowded mall, taking off your mask and coughing on people, only like worse in that culture. So what she did was wrong and against the law. But she did it anyway. So that kind of provokes me. Not only did she go out in public and contaminate everybody and break all the laws, but she went into a large crowd of people, right? So it's not like she was contaminating one or two neighbors. She was contaminating this whole crowd of people. That's just, that just takes a lot of guts to do something like that. That's just like crazy. Not only did she go into a crowd and contaminate a whole bunch of people, but she snuck up behind Jesus and touched him. She touched a man, which in that culture would have been considered uh, terribly inappropriate. That, I mean, technically, in that culture, it was sexual assault. Men do not touch women. Women do not touch men in that culture. Anybody ever travel like in a really conservative Muslim culture or something like that? It was like that. Right? So it would have been considered sexual assault. Not only did she touch a man, she touched a holy man. She touched a rabbi. So she was contaminating and sexually assaulting a holy man like me. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Holy men get a lot of respect, you know. But, but she didn't respect him a- at all, uh, according to this. Oh, thanks. According to this story. <clears throat> Excuse me, a lot of talking this weekend. <clears throat> so everything she did was wrong. And then there's this final piece that is just all wrong. She thinks, I'm going to sneak up behind this guy and I'm going to touch his clothes and that's going to make me well. That's just wrong. That's not how you do it. Is that how you do it? Vineyard? This is not how you do it. That's the wrong model. All of this stuff was wrong. And so I asked myself, why did she believe this? Why did she trust that that was, this was going to work? Because that's what it was. It was this high degree of trust. Jesus calls it out. Oh, that sort of behavior is faith. How did she get this kind of idea? How did she get this kind of faith? Desperate times call for desperate measures. Desperation. I can tell you that desperation does not lead to faith. Do you know what desperation leads to? Depression. Depression. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so I'm sure she was desperate, but it was desperate plus something. Right? Well, I'm going to give you eight seconds to be brilliant. I tell my church that all the time. Just think for eight seconds. Think about it. How did she come to this conclusion? She heard about Jesus. The only thing we know about this woman, other than she was a wreck, her life had just been wrecked, was that she heard about Jesus. Which just begs another question in my mind. What the heck did she hear? What the heck did she hear about Jesus to make her behave like this? Because I've heard a lot about Jesus. And that he was radical. What does that mean? Radical. That he was not normal. Keep going. He was a rule breaker. Yeah. 
in some way, shape, or form, clearly, I mean, she'd heard about his miracles and, and stuff like that, but she also heard that Jesus was inappropriate. I don't know exactly how it got to her, but that's what she heard, because that's how she behaved. Oh, this is a guy who's inappropriate, and therefore I am empowered to be inappropriate. You know, she heard those stories about, you know, how he was lo- hugging lepers who were also considered unclean people, or how he was hanging out with uh, prostitutes and, and, and thieves and tax collectors and stuff like that. And that was his crowd. And so she felt like, well, I fit in, <laughs> you know. He was offending all of the proper people, all the, all the proper uh, priests and stuff. And so she thought, well, this, this is going to work. Somehow she put it together. I don't know. I look forward to talking to her someday uh, in the next life. But she, she put it together. She had heard that Jesus was inappropriate, and it released faith. If you want to be a person of faith, I'm on a hunt for great faith myself. Evidently, this sort of idea of inappropriateness, of radicalness, of abnormality is key. It's one of the things that creates great faith, the sort of, great, uh, the sort of faith that excites Jesus, that makes him want to hear your whole story, that makes your whole story worth sharing in front of a crowd. And he's like, that's faith. That's faith. Does everybody understand? And I'm reading the story thinking, I'm trying. <laughs> inappropriateness. So the Christian-y word for this sort of inappropriateness, radicalness, abnormality is grace. It's not a word that appears in the Gospels. The Apostle Paul started writing about it when he was trying to explain things to the Greeks in the epistles. It's like grace, grace. Grace is a term that, that means like radical generosity. And it's a tough concept to get. But I think it's key to releasing great faith in our lives. Uh, grace is foreign to the world. The world does not understand grace because the world does not have grace. The world does not have the sort of radical generosity that we're talking about. Because grace is a tension. And that's the thing that makes it so hard for us to understand. Here's grace. Grace isn't just, you know, like the radical generosity alone. Uh, Grace is this. It's having a very clear standard and then being generous about how you apply that standard. You have to hold both things in tension. And the world can't do that. So what the world does is the world pretends there really is no clear standard. There really is no moral standard. There's no behavioral standard. Like, the, like health isn't clear. You know, that sort of thing. Relativist. Some Christians, on the other hand, are really uncomfortable with the generosity part. And they focus on the rules a lot. We call them legalists. And they get kind of bogged down in, in the standards. But can't breathe well because there's no generosity uh, in, in their lives. And, and, and I have a lot of sympathy here because when somebody violates the standards, it seems that they're offending God, you know, because God gave you those rules and you are totally disobeying them. That dishonors God. I mean, that tells me that you don't take God seriously, right? Which is what people should have said to this woman. It's like, you realize that the whole crowd now is paying for what you did. They're contaminated, they're ceremonial and clean. They would have had to go to the, to the priests and get ceremonially washed and stuff like that. You realize you're a burden, right? So that's what they would have said. But what Christians really need to do is they need to be very clear about what the standard is and then very generous in how they apply it and kind of hold that at intention and be willing to kind of be inappropriate. And if we pull it off, We just unleash faith in our lives, which means that we unleash miracles in our lives, which means that we can like to restore people miraculously and stuff like that, and of course be restored miraculously. We have to not worry about being appropriate so much and honor the principles of God 
and just trust and just be brave and just try because faith means trying. And this woman, one of the great triers in the Bible, I know what I'll do. I'll steal a miracle. I'll sneak up behind him and, and, and just take it. Anyway, still trying to figure out faith, but I know that grace is key. And then I know that power flows. And I just wondered this morning if there weren't people here who maybe, I don't know, maybe need miraculous power released in their life and therefore need to have faith and therefore need to understand grace. Because evidently they're all connected. Maybe your faith doesn't need to be perfect. Maybe it only needs to be 70%. Or so, I don't know, that's my figure now. Um, maybe the only kind of faith that works is imperfect faith, right? Because only imperfect faith needs grace. Uh, so maybe if your faith is, is imperfect, but you kind of fill up the gaps uh, with grace. Maybe that's the key to kind of releasing the revival in your life that you need, the renewal in your life that you need. Maybe that's the key to restoring your family, restoring your relationships. Shoot, I don't know what's possible because evidently there's no right model. Evidently you just hear something about Jesus and become inappropriate and trifle. Is that a word? Should be. Should be. Uh, so I'd just like to pray for you this morning, uh, if, if that's you. Uh, Holy Spirit, I pray that in this beautiful congregation, oh, a church is a beautiful thing, Lord, and this is a beautiful church. I pray that you would release imperfect faith to these people, uh, to these imperfect people, these imperfect, beautiful people. And I pray, Lord, that you would release grace in this congregation and that you would make us fluent in grace in a way that maintains the tension, that makes us people of truth as well as people of generosity. I pray, Lord, that you would make connections with people if they feel like they need to sneak up behind you and touch you, that they're not quite qualified to approach you from the front, um, release your power anyway. And I pray, Lord, that you would release in this place great stories, stories that need to be told in front of a crowd, stories that Jesus himself would delight to hear. And I pray, Lord, that you would release miracles this morning, miracles of restoration, The whole history of your past 12 years could be overturned in a moment. And then you could go in peace, free from your suffering. And everybody would have to honor you, according to Jesus' word. Let it come, Holy Spirit. Let it come. And just because I'm here and this is what I like to do, um, can I just pray for you this morning if you've come with a need for healing in your body? Anybody have anything that, uh, in your body that needs to be healed? Just go ahead and raise your hand and wave it at me. Keep it up there so I can see you all. Oh, that's good. It's a good number of people. Can I have uh, you uh, stand up where you are, which might be a little bit awkward, but I am told that faith is close to brave. So... And that Jesus is inappropriate. Uh, so there's more of you than there are of me. So I'd just like to recruit the people around you as my ministry team. If you could stand up uh, if you're around these people and maybe uh, lay a hand on uh, their shoulder uh, politely but inappropriately. And, and just make a connection. And maybe, the, maybe you could tell uh, these people uh, your story. Uh, give them like a one sentence description of your problem. If you would, you know, just ask and they're going to say, well, I have a headache or my stomach is sick or, um, 
I have arthritis or I'm suffering from diabetes, whatever it is. Just tell them what's wrong. Take a second and tell them what's wrong. And then because we are a church, we are a beautiful people, those of you who are on my ministry team, just speak a blessing to these people now. A couple of you just speak it out loud. In the name of Jesus, I bless your body with healing. In the name of Jesus, we release grace to you. Nobody's praying for this woman right here yet. Somebody get over here and lay a hand on their shoulder. Come on. There you go. Make a connection. Push through the crowd. Throw some elbows. That sort of thing. Just bless them. Bless them. No, oh, this behind you? You're, you need prayer too, right? Somebody get this gal. There you go. Make a connection. Release a moment of miracle. In the name of Jesus, brothers and sisters, your faith makes you well. In the name of Jesus, brothers and sisters, you've done it. You've pushed through and made connection with Jesus, the manifestation of God on our earth, our Lord, our restorer. You've done it. Your faith makes you well. Receive in your body now the restoration that makes you free. In the name of Jesus, sickness go away. In the name of Jesus, injuries be healed. In the name of Jesus, depression and isolation, you are broken. In Christ's name, amen. We'll check in on that later and see what the differences are. The worship team is going to sing a song or two. Let's celebrate grace. Oh, wait. We have another holy man on the stage. I did not. Okay. Um, so once a month we have something called Holy Spirit Night. We worship longer. It's a little bit more free-flowing. We make space for God to do stuff, etc. We try to once a quarter as a church have a Holy Spirit Sunday where our Sunday service is a little bit more like Holy Spirit Night. Next Sunday is going to be a Holy Spirit Sunday, and we're specifically having a healing Sunday. And what that means is please go and invite people with ideally non-contagious sicknesses to come to church next week on Sunday, and we're going to do exactly what we just did. We're going to say who here is sick and needs healing, and anyone who does stand up, and everybody around them, bless them right now. And we're going to expect God to do some healing next week. And God loves to heal people who, like, don't know him and haven't heard of him and have opinions that maybe, you know, who cares? God doesn't care. Uh, that's what I've discovered. So um, invite people next week. Bring them here. If you're on the prayer team, could you come up here and stand on one of the two sides? If you would like to continue to receive prayer or more prayer, yeah. these people are trained to pray with the authority and power of God. And so you can come up and receive prayer for anything under the sun this morning. On that note, Let's worship together. Thank you, Jordan.
God, we invite you to work in our families. So we speak the name of Jesus over our families. Every week, we have the opportunity to take communion together as a church family. There are two tables at the front of the room and one table in the back. The tables have unleavened bread and juice on them. These element, elements signify Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remember, remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and gave thanks. He gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. You can go to the Lord's table anytime in the next song.
continue to sing and the prayer team will stay and pray if you still haven't come up for prayer um, but if you want to go you are dismissed um, I send you with a blessing of faith and miraculous encounters God I pray that each and every person in this room would go out in their week and that they would share their faith and share your love with their community with their workplace schools, wherever they go this week. Use them to bring you, to bring your hope, to bring your truth. And in Jesus' name, amen.